Pliny the Younger Book 6, Letter 16 To Cornelius Tacitus You are desirous that I should give you an account of the death of my uncle, that you may be enabled to transmit it to posterity with the greater truth. I return you thanks. I foresee that his death, when celebrated by you, must procure eternal honour to his name. For although his fall was attended by the destruction of most beautiful territories, seeming, as it were, destined to be remembered equally with those nations and cities who perish by some memorable event. Although he had compiled works both numerous and lasting, yet the immortality of your writings will lengthen out the character which he hath established to himself. I consider it as a blessing to be possessed of endowments which either qualify us for actions worthy of public record or inspire us to write anything worthy of public attention. But I think those persons peculiarly favoured from heaven who obtain both these qualifications. My uncle, by his own works and by yours, may be numbered among these last. For which reason, I more readily undertake, and even wish for the employment that you enjoin. He was at Mycenaeum, where he had the command of a fleet which was stationed there. On the ninth of the calends of September, the 23rd of August, about the seventh hour, one o'clock, my mother informed him that a cloud appeared of unusual size and shape. After having reposed himself in the sun and used the cold bath, he had tasted a slight repast and was returned to his studies. He immediately called for his sandals and repaired to an higher point of view from whence he might more plainly discern this prodigy. The cloud the spectators could not distinguish at a distance from what mountain it arose, but it was afterwards found to be Vesuvius. The cloud advanced in height, nor can I give you a more just representation of it than the form of a pine tree. For springing up in a direct line like a tall trunk, the branches were widely distended. I believe, while the vapour was fresh, it more easily ascended. But when that vapour was wasted, the cloud became loose. 
or perhaps, oppressed by its own gravity, dilated itself into a greater breadth. It sometimes appeared bright, and sometimes black or spotted, according to the quantities of earth and ashes mixed with it. This was a surprising circumstance, and it deserved, in the opinion of that learned man, to be inquired into more exactly. He commanded a Liburnian galley to be prepared for him, and made me an offer of accompanying him, if I pleased. I replied it was more agreeable to me to pursue my studies. And, as it happened, he had allotted me something at that time to write. He went out of the house with his tablets in his hand. The mariners at Retigny, being under consternation at the approaching danger, for that village was situated under the mountain, nor were there any means of escaping but by sea, entreated him not to venture upon so hazardous an enterprise. He continued firm to his resolution, and performed with great fortitude of mind what he had at first undertaken from a thirst of knowledge. He commanded the galleys to put off from land, and embarked with a design not only to relieve the people of Retigny, but many others in distress, as the shore was interspersed with a variety of pleasant villages. He sailed immediately to places which were abandoned by other people, and boldly held his course in the face of danger so composed as to remark distinctly the appearance and progress of this dreadful calamity, and to digest and dictate those remarks. He now found that the ashes beat into the ships much hotter and in greater quantities. And as he drew nearer, pumice stones with black flints, burnt and torn up by the flames, broke in upon them. And now the hasty ebb of the sea and ruins tumbling from the mountain hindered their nearer approach to the shore. Pausing a little upon this, whether he should not return back, and instigated to it by the pilot, he cries out, Fortune assists the brave! Let us make the best of our way to Pomponianus, who was then at Stabii, and lay opposite to a bay into which the sea, creeping gently along that winding coast, insinuates itself. Pomponianus, although not in immediate peril, Yet, seeing it plainly, and finding it approaching fast, 
was putting his baggage on board some vessels, with a design of making his escape by sea whenever the contrary wind should abate. My uncle arriving with a fair wind at this place, embraced, comforted, and encouraged his trembling friend. And to effect this, seemed himself to be under no kind of apprehension, but ordering his servants to carry him to the bath. When he had bathed, went to supper, either with a real cheerfulness, or, what is equally the sign of a great mind, the appearance of it. In the meantime, flames issued from various parts of Mount Vesuvius, and spreading wide, and towering to a great height, made a vast blaze. The glare and horror of which were still increased by the gloominess of the night. My uncle, to remove the general fear, said that the blaze was occasioned by the villages being on fire, which were now deserted by the country people. Then, retiring to take his rest, he enjoyed a sound sleep. For being of a gross and corpulent habit of body, he was heard to snore by those who waited upon him. The court beyond which was his apartment, by this time was so filled with cinders and pumice stones, that had he continued any longer in his room, his passage from it would have been stopped up. Being awakened, therefore, he quitted his chamber and returned to Pomponianus and the rest, whose fears had hindered them from sleeping, and who had been upon the watch. They consulted together whether it would be more advisable to keep under the shelter of that roof or retire into the fields. For the house tottered to and fro, as if it had been shaken from the foundation by the frequent earthquakes. On the other hand, they dreaded the stones, which, by being burnt into cinders, although they fell with no great weight, yet fell in large quantities. But after considering the different hazards which they run, the advice of going out prevailed. In others, one kind of fear conquered another. In my uncle, one prudential reason only succeeded to another. They covered their heads with pillows bound with napkins. This was their only defence against the shower of stones. 
And now, when it was day everywhere else, they were surrounded with darkness, blacker and more dismal than night. which, however, was sometimes dispersed by several flashes and eruptions from the mountain. They agreed to go farther in upon the shore and to look out from the neighboring land if they might venture to sea. But the sea continued raging and tempestuous. Then my uncle, laying himself down upon a cloth spread on the ground, called twice for some water and drank it. But the flames and a stench of sulphur which preceded them obliged others to immediate flight and roused him. He raised himself upon his feet, supported by two servants, but his respiration being stopped, he immediately dropped down. Stifled, as I imagine, by the sulphur and grossness of the air, His lungs, as he was narrow-chested, were naturally weak and subject to inflammations. When the light returned, which was not until the third day after his death, his body was discovered untouched by the fire, without any visible hurt, in the dress in which he fell. Appearing rather like a person sleeping than like one who was dead. My mother and I still continued at Mycenaeum. But this hath no relation to the history, nor did you desire any particulars except those of my uncle's death. I shall therefore finish my letter, adding only, that I have sent you all the circumstances which I either saw myself or were communicated to me at a time when the truth of every single incident could be easily recollected. From hence you will select such passages as you shall think proper. For it is one thing to write a letter, another to compile an history. Nor is the difference less between writing to a friend in particular than to the world in general. Farewell.